sitting down there thinking I'm trying to drown the poor woman. <laughs> and, um, but I never did get her completely under, uh, but I got most of her under. Her nose was sticking out. But anyway, we left it at that before the daughter had a heart attack completely. <laughs> The young fellow invited his friend to church. And the friend had never really been to church, so, but he agreed to go. And, and so it was all kind of foreign to him. And, and so everything that happened, he was kind of poking his buddy and saying, you know, what's that mean? And, uh, and so the choir got up to sing and poked his buddy. What's that? He's trying to know the choir sang. He took out the collection. What's that? So he was trying to know the collection. Finally, the preacher got up to preach. And he, Took his watch off and laid it on the floor. What's that mean? And in his best, tired out, been there, seen all that before voice, he said, That, unfortunately, doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Want to share with you some thoughts uh, around this question that Job asked Do you fix your eye on them? Um, the NIV says, do you fix your eye on such a one? Depending on the translations you're using, the, the words change just slightly. But does God watch us? Technology makes it very hard to be alone. Uh, we live in a world where we're constantly being watched. You go into a store, there's security cameras. Um, people can go around you and Google people's property and, and see their property on the computer. Uh, it's hard to be alone in this world. It's hard not to be in contact with someone or be watched by someone. But Job asks a bigger question. Not is someone watching, but is God watching? And so over the next few minutes, I want to explore that question a bit and think about these three elements of it. One, when is God watching? Secondly, why is God watching? And then thirdly, what is God's goal in watching? So when is God watching? Well, the short answer to that question do you fix your eye on them? In other words, is God watching us human beings? Is yes, God is watching. But is he watching all the time? Or does he take some breaks? Does he go for a little snack, a little R&R? Is -R? he watching some of the time or all the time? Well, sometimes in Israel's history, they got the idea that God wasn't watching, that he didn't see or else he didn't really care. Psalm 10 speaks of the wicked man in verse 2 of that psalm. And then he goes on in verses 10 and 11 to say, of the wicked man, his victims are crushed, they collapse, they fall under his strength. He says to himself, God is forgotten. He covers his face and never sees. Psalm 94, again, speaking of the wicked, says, they say, the Lord does not see. The God of Jacob pays no heed. Isaiah 47.10 addresses Babylon, and Isaiah asserts, You have trusted in your wickedness and have said, No one sees me. Ezekiel proclaims the Lord's word about, uh, about Israel. Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own idol? They say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. And then in chapter 9, verse 9, Ezekiel says, the sin of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed, and the city is full of injustice. And I say, the Lord has forsaken the land. The Lord does not see. But the Bible tells us that God is watching, and he does care. Psalm 121, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. And Psalm 139, one of those 
uh, psalms that can be very reassuring uh, if you're a believer and living for the Lord. can be very troubling if you're not. Psalm 139, just listen to verses 7 through 16. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the, earth, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. There is no where. There is no time when we are out of the vision and the reach of God. He sees us in the womb before we are born, in heaven or in the depths, day or night. God is watching and God cares what we are doing and what we are experiencing. And that can be very comforting that no matter what life throws our way, sickness, Ridicule, persecution, financial hardship, loneliness. God knows about it. And God cares about us. It can also be a very scary thing. If we aren't living for God, if we are mistreating others and delving into sinful practices and ways of life, then the thought that God is watching and God cares about what we are doing holds a certain terror, or it should. Job asked, do you fix your eye on such a one? Will you bring him before you for judgment? Again, the answer is yes. The Bible teaches that God will have a day when we stand before him for judgment. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, Jesus tells about the separation of sheep and the goat, and the sheep being those who live their lives in obedience to God, and they will take their, the inheritance he has for them, while the goats are those who live for their own advantage, who couldn't be bothered to help anyone, and they will be told to part from me. You are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation 20, 11, 15 tells of the great white throne judgment where the dead are brought back to life for judgment, and anyone whose name is not found written in the book of life is thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus confirms the day of judgment when he says, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Father just as they honor the Son. And he has given him authority to judge, because he is the Son of Man. 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul writes, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And in Acts, Acts chapter 17, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Psalm 94, which we mentioned a little earlier, warns those who think God doesn't see or care. The psalmist writes, take heed. Does he who implanted the ear not hear? Does he who formed the eye not see? Does he who disciplines the nations not punish? Does he who teaches lack knowledge? See, God is watching. And he's watching all the time. And he cares what we are doing and what we are experiencing. So why is he watching? Back in chapter 7 of Job, Job had asked a, another question. What is man that you make so much of him, that you give him so much attention, that you examine him every morning and test him every moment? 
Job is looking at things through the lens of his sickness and the tragedies that have befallen him. We're at an advantage that Job didn't have. We can open the book of Job and, and read those opening verses where it tells us what's going on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. And we know that Satan has come and, and has said to God, why wouldn't Job love him? You've blessed him with everything. He never has a problem. Take away his wealth. Take away his family and you'll see that he doesn't make so much of you. And God said, no, I know Job. He'll be true. So you go ahead. You take away his health. You take away his wealth. You take away his family. Just spare his life. You can't take his life. And that is the advantage that we can see, that we know that, that Job didn't have. Job just knows that life all at once has turned bad for him. He's lost. His, his children have been killed. His flocks have been stolen. Uh, his, his health has gone. And his wife has told him he should curse God and die and get it over with. And looking through that lens, Job is confused. And Job thinks that for some unknown and inexplicable reason, God has brought this upon him. The psalmist in Psalm 8 looks through a different lens. He looks at the wonder of creation, the stars, the moon, the heavens, thinks about the angels and considers the privileges that God has bestowed upon mankind and asks a similar question to what Job had asked. Job said, what is man that you make so much of him, that you give him so much attention, that you examine him every morning and test him every moment? The psalmist says, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for? And the answer to that question is found in creation. Each day as God created, he pronounced it good. But on the sixth day, after creating human beings, he pronounced his creation not good, but very good. Of all the things in creation, only one is said to be created in the image of God, and that is you and I, human beings. We are the closest thing in all creation to God. It was into Adam that God is said to have breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. It was to Adam that God brought the animals to name. It was to Adam and Eve that God came in the cool of the day to meet and talk with them. And it was to Adam and Eve that he gave the charge to rule over creation and care for it. Human beings, as Lord Morrow suggests, are more than flesh and blood, bits of matter thrown together and animated by chemical reactions. If that is all we were, then food and water would be enough for us to live and fulfill our purpose in life. But the Bible says, men do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. An assertion that Jesus vindicated when Jesus tempted him to turn stones into bread. Jesus' reply was, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the book of God. We are spiritual beings. And we need to be in touch and in step with God, our creator, and the giver of our spirits. We spent a lot of time in years gone by, uh, traveling around the hockey rinks. Our son was in hockey, and uh, we traveled all over Southern New Brunswick. We were to Edmiston one year for provincials. We were to Chipman one year for provincials. Um, we had an interest in the kids that were on that team. But there was one kid that had special interest for us, because he was ours. And whether he was on the ice or on the bench, we kept an eye on him. Because he was our kid. And God watches us because we have a special place in his heart. 
He cares. He's interested. And whether things are going well or whether things are going bad, he wants to know. So what is God's goal in watching? What does he hope to accomplish by keeping an eye on us and being informed about what's going on in our lives? Well, just like the parents in the stands at the hockey rink, God's motivation is love. For God so loved the world, John tells us, and gave his one and only Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God washed human beings. And it didn't take long to realize that they were going to be an unruly lot. By Genesis 3, Adam and Eve have sinned and driven from the Garden of Eden, their idyllic friendship with God raptured. By chapter 4, their sons, Cain, their one son, kills his brother, their other son, Abel. Things are unraveling in a hurry. By chapter 8 of Genesis, the flood has destroyed all earth, all life on earth, except Noah and those with him on the ark. Because Noah was one of the few righteous people that were living on the earth. Everyone else had fallen away. Gone their own way, put themselves in the place of God, tried to run their lives rather than listening to God's will. And Noah, righteous man that he was, is charged along with those few survivors with him with repopulating the earth. There's an interesting little verse buried in Genesis chapter 5. Uh, in the creation account, it says that we are, as human beings, made in the image of God. Of course, in chapter 3, we have the, the fall, the disobedience of eating the, eating the forbidden fruit. And in chapter 5, following the murder of Abel, it says that Adam and Eve have another son, Seth. And it doesn't say that Seth was made in the image of God. It says that he was made in the image of Adam. Tainted seed. A seed that has been corrupted by sin. The image of God still exists, but it's not in its fullness as it was in those early days. And Noah's seed is tainted seed, which merely produced tainted offspring. God vowed never again to destroy the earth and all life of the flood. There was a better way to deal with man's perversion and sin and restore the bond that had existed in Eden before God between God and his creatures. And so he sent his son. His son, who became sin, even though he knew no sin. His son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Because as John reminds us in the next verse, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. What does God hope to accomplish by watching? By being informed? Illustration. Sin had driven a wedge between God and mankind. Adam sinned. We inherited a sinful nature. We sinned. But Christ came to pay the penalty of our sin and restores our relationship with so we put our faith in Jesus. We inherit his righteousness and are restored to the fellowship of God and look forward to eternal life. Yes, God's eye is on us. Yes, he's watching. But his first and foremost an eye of love and concern. Only reluctantly as a last resort does it become an eye of judgment. We're going to celebrate communion in a few moments. We celebrate that gift of God's love. Love sent Jesus to the cross. And we can have mercy for my sin. Praise God.
Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who loves us, who's concerned for us, who's interested in us, good times and bad, when we live the way we should and when we don't. And Father, that your first priority is to, to show us love, to bring us back into the relationship that you would have us have with you. We pray, Lord, this morning that as we gather around the Lord's table that you would just help us to think about that love. Help us to feel it, to be awed by it, and to respond to it. We pray in Jesus' name.